Hi guys. It is a dark and stormy and somewhat gloomy day here in the collapse of global industrial civilization here at Bugs in a Jar Farm outside of Ithaca, New York. So uh, it is your lucky day here on Collapse Chronicles. You get two chronicles of the collapse in one day so I don't get cabin fever too bad here. Uh, oh yes, I am Sam Mitchell. This is Collapse Chronicles and of course this is my little soggy co-pilot Sancho Panza. So I am so sorry. I cannot remember which one of my alert viewers sent me this uh, article I want to share with you and I really do appreciate everybody sending me, keeping me well supplied with doom and gloom. Uh, keep the cards and letters coming. Uh, but this is coming from a website I have never heard of called War on the Rocks. National Security for Insiders by Insiders. And this is a uh, national security column written by a woman named Sharon Burke. So don't recognize who is Sharon. Sharon Burke is the director of the Resource Security Program at New America. I have no idea what New America is. Resource Security Program. Previously, Sharon served as an Assistant Secretary of Defense in the Obama administration. So what is on Sharon's mind this week? Straight ahead, uh, there is no containment strategy for climate change. I guess containment strategy is a military term. You know, I guess containing the enemy. So when the enemy is the climate, good luck on a containment strategy. Take it away, Sharon. Now, I'm going to put the link on here. This is a long analysis and I really suggest you read this yourself. There's links to all sorts of her reference material and whatnot. And she's got maps and charts and graphs and all that good stuff that the Paul Beckwith crowd likes so much. Uh, so I will not get to all of it, but I encourage you to go on the link and read it yourself. But if you just want to sit around and let me read part of it for you, I'll be happy to do that. Take it away, Sharon. <clears throat> the earliest humans had it rough. They survived a brutal ice age, dwindling to a population estimated at just 10,000. You know, I've heard this theory before. Man, we got so close. So close. We got down to 10,000 humans on this planet, and here we are at 8 billion. <clears throat> So dwindling to a population estimated at just 10,000, only to experience terrible droughts when the ice began to retreat. So they engaged in the oldest climate adapt strategy in history. Like Sam Mitchell at Collapse Chronicles, they moved. And uh, I think some of you think I am joking when I call myself a climate refugee. That is exactly what I am. Uh, it is why I moved from a floodplain in Texas, well, to a floodplain in New York and a floodplain in Florida in the winter. I just can't get away. Anyway, uh, it's too damn hot in Texas and it is 70 degrees here and 100 degrees in Austin. So I understand the earliest humans moving. Yes. The first great human migration out of the Horn of Africa happened some 60,000 years ago, and it was disruptive. Everywhere Homo sapiens went, they overwhelmed other hominins, not to mention uh, every other earthling they uh, overwhelmed, setting the genetic foundation for all modern societies around the world. A wildly successful species, humans now number 7.8 billion consuming habitat and destroying other species 
at an increasingly fast clip. And again, she has all of this, uh, her commentary sourced to uh, referencing you to all these other links. Uh, in fact, that catastrophic success, that is the, an excellent term, uh, no, shut up. Uh, in fact, that catastrophic, catastrophic, I like that word, catastrophic success has now set the stage for the next great human migration, once again driven by an unfavorable climate. Over the next 50 years, I would say over the next 20 years, but certainly over the next 50 years, as many as 3 billion people may be living in increasingly dangerous hot conditions, can you say Austin, Texas, and a large number of them may decide to move. This time, the mass migration has the potential to be even more disruptive than its prehistoric predecessor, given how many more people there are now. Just how disruptive that move will be depends a great deal on how the people in the more temperate parts of the world react. Surprisingly, uh, people are pretty friendly. These Yankees up here in New York are pretty friendly to this uh, southern boy. So far, we will see in a few years from now. Uh, yes. And how wealthier populations within those countries handle unequal exposure to climate impacts both within their borders and globally. Yep, and then she has all sorts of population growth charts and maps and all kinds of good stuff if you go on to the link. <clears throat> so now she's going to connect a few dots between overpopulation and climate change migration. <clears throat> Climate change affects every nation on the planet, but in general, temperate zone countries, otherwise known as much of North America, most of Europe and China, and parts of India, South America, and Oceania, <clears throat> will fare relatively better for much of this century. Any number of tipping points could change that picture quickly, however, do you think so? Such as the collapse of the Antarctic ice sheet. The latest research from Greenland suggests that there is definitely calls for concern when it comes to melting ice, even without the worst case scenario as though the middle latitudes will not have it easy. Hurricane Harvey in the United States, it was actually Hurricane Harvey was the final straw for me is when I decided to sell my place <clears throat> on a Texas floodplain and get the hell out of Texas to end up on this floodplain in New York was Hurricane Harvey. Uh, yep, yep, yep. Uh, hurri <clears throat> Hurricane Harvey in the United States and the recent flooding in China offer a preview of how costly and difficult climatological disasters are even for big economies. India has very densely populated cities and high vulnerability to natural disasters and is struggling with the highest numbers of internally displaced people in the world. The Indian government's approach to dealing with internal migration already falls short of the country's commitments to human rights. There is the understatement of this article so far. <clears throat> Slower onset climate changes, listen up, book hermit, as Slower onset climate changes 
will be disruptive as well. Agricultural productivity, for example, is likely to fall in many places because of droughts, higher temperatures, and generally more volatile weather. Global agricultural productivity also will shift northward, meaning that some of today's farm communities may be tomorrow's ghost towns. For, sm for such small, vulnerable countries as the island nations of Oceania, this climate shift may be existential, regardless of whether they are in the temperate or torrid zones of the Earth. I love that term, torrid zone. Their experience may well be an early warning of the coming difficulties of migration as a strategy for dealing with climate change. As soon as 2030, 10 years from now, sea level rise, salt water intrusion, can you say the Everglades National Park, salt water intrusion and more destructive cyclonic storms will pose an overwhelming threat to many of these low-lying Pacific islands and territories even as warming oceans are undermining fisheries. While there are some possible engineering solutions, yes, they are expensive and it is unclear where the money will come from. This, meaning, you know, those little small island nations, is not a large population to relocate. The total population of Oceania is three million, but it is a large number to absorb as Australia's reluctance to take in present-day refugees suggests. More to the point, evacuating the population <clears throat> means the destruction of an entire culture and way of life. This is more than an abstract moral question for the United States, which has legal responsibilities for the populations of the Marshall Islands. The, my, uh, my cousin is the ambassador to the Marshall Islands. Uh, has legal responsibility for the population of the Marshall Islands, the Federated States of Micronesia, and the Republic of Palau, nearly 200,000 people, as well as for more than 250,000 U.S. citizens in Guam, Mariana Islands, and American Samoa. Uh, and for that matter, both Guam and this island and the Marshall Islands are home to strategically significant U.S. military bases and there is little evidence of any U.S. strategy for managing climate change at these locations, which means that uh, these military bases are going underwater. <clears throat> There are strong equity concerns within temperate countries, too, given that the populations most susceptible to the impacts of climate change, such as coastal flooding, are also most likely to suffer from social and economic disadvantages and racial discrimination. Native American communities in Louisiana and Alaska are already being forced to move by climate change related factors. Uh, for example, almost half of those who fled New Orleans during Hurricane Katrina did not return after the storm, especially black residents of the city. A decade later, the population was still only 80% of its pre-Katrina level. The Houston area and the Austin area, is Houston and Austin is where these people headed to. The Houston area was a top destination for many of those displaced persons who were then hit again by Hurricane Harvey in 2017, which had a disproportionate effect on black Houstonians. Uh, 
even given the well-established vulnerability of coastal populations, the United States has done little to prepare for the increase in internally displaced people. The inequity within, the, within U.S. borders mirrors the global impacts of climate change, which will disproportionately affect countries in the subtropical and tropical parts of the globe. That puts most of the population of Africa in the climate change crosshairs, as well as hundreds of millions of people in South Asia, the Middle East, South America, and Central America. Many of the affected countries, especially in Africa, have growing high-density populations with high societal vulnerabilities as measured by per capita income, life expectancy, maternal health and infant mortality, access to clean water, and other factors. <clears throat> the reasons for this disparity with mid-latitude countries are complex but include centuries of disadvantageous interaction with the forces of industrialization that largely caused climate change in the first place. And uh, I'm just going to quickly mention another uh, reader uh, sent me this, another listener sent me this story from AP coming out on the same day uh, about sub-Saharan African migrants from good old Associated Press uh, pretty much mirroring uh, this essay here. Everything she's talking about in the near future is showing up in the Associated Press today. Imagine that. Uh, then she has this handy dandy little chart on population growth and <clears throat> climate vulnerability. You will not believe this, folks, but many countries with high population growth also have vulnerability to climate change. Huh, do you think so? Traditionally, displaced people stay relatively close to home, but if climate change worsens conditions to the point that basic survival is in question, people who can move will move, and people who cannot may be left in increasingly dire conditions. Furthermore, if worsening conditions inflame already unstable situations, they may catalyze violence and conflict which historically make more people move faster and farther. In that sense, climate change interacts with other drivers of instability, such as corruption, unequal access to power, a history of enmity, and inadequate or unequal access to natural resources. Do you think so? In the past, the Pentagon has referred to climate change as, quote, an instability accelerant because of the way it interacts with other root causes of war. Many migrants don't particularly want to move, and their journeys are generally perilous, but the true danger is increasingly what they face when they arrive, which is what this uh, story from the AP is all about. Maybe I will get to that when uh, tomorrow. I'm not. I don't have three chronicles of the collapse in one day. Uh, globally, immigration is unpopular, and violence against migrants is on the rise. China's Ministry of Justice recently proposed a policy for admitting some high-value immigrants 
and was met with a swift popular backlash, India, the world's largest source of out migration, can you say the Patel Hotel, uh, India, the world's largest source of out migration, is far less welcoming welcoming to inward movements with barbed wire fences along its borders with Bangladesh and Pakistan and a new restrictive citizenship law. Much of the European Union is meeting the ongoing influx of migrants with a range of discriminatory and inhumane policies. The European Union is positioning itself to halt future climate migrants from the Sahel region of Africa in particular, which climate change will hit especially hard. Again, that's all in this other story. Uh, even the United States, with the highest immigrant population in the world, is building a border wall imprisoning migrants, including children, in inhumane conditions and restricting and barring immigration for a number of categories of workers. Uh, the most recent restrictions included the skilled visa holders heavily employed by big tech Climate change is already one of the factors driving increased migration from Central America and Mexico into the United States and the U.S. and the current U.S. administration has slashed aid to all of these nations. The rejection of migrants flies in the face of the evidence that these new arrivals generally make a positive contribution to the receiving communities. And guys, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to skip ahead. Uh, we, we, we enter a little bit of snowflake uh, territory here, and this is a long article. Uh, so I'm going to skip over the snowflake part about how uh, migrants, uh, welcoming migrants is always a good thing. Uh, not going to open up that can of worms. Anyway, okay, let's move on to the last three paragraphs of this story. There is an even bigger long-term potential opportunity, albeit an ominous one, for what it says about the state of climate change. The vast territories of thawing permafrost, which will total an estimated two and a half million square miles by the end of the century, may offer an entirely new frontier for settlement though it is now unclear if these lands will be suitable for human habitation. The permafrost that is already melting, that's why I call it the temperfrost, is subset, subject to giant sinkholes, avalanches, and thaw slumps where muddy land sinks away from an icy readout, and there are the mosquito tornadoes, mosquito tornadoes, beyond just the question of livability, melting permafrost also may be, melting permafrost may be <clears throat> releasing large amounts of greenhouse gases and thawed pathogens, some known such as anthrax, and some not seen in human history. Still, if the land can be reclaimed, Canada and Russia will see the biggest gains along with the U.S., meaning Alaska and Greenland. 
So we will see how much lemonade they make out of these lemons. In the meantime, while we're waiting to see about the thawing permafrost, in the meantime, the individuals lucky enough to be born in the mid-latitudes may think they don't like migrants. Yes, uh, we, get, we go back into the snowflakes. Uh, yes. All right. Uh, oh, well, she actually, you know, she actually goes through all of this list uh, about uh, how more legal immigration uh, has to cooperate to make sure conditions are better for people who do not migrate. That means improvements in irrigation and water management and electrification, more education for more young people, better health systems, equitable distribution of resources, and improved governments. It means prioritizing innovation in air conditioning. There you go. Moving away from technology dependent on fossil fuels and other greenhouse gases, these may sound like nice to do policies, but they are not. People are going to move if they have no other choice, and they are already moving in record numbers. The people left behind will suffer terribly without help and the suffering may not stay contained. Yes. The stage is set for the next great human migration, and it would be much better if all of, for all if this were a conscious and coordinated process. Yes, dream on, girl. Rather than one dictated by suffering, hatred, and violence, which is exactly what is going to be dictated by. But even if it is possible to reconcile emptying temperate zones with growing populations in places afflicted by climate change, this huge resettlement will only be the first act. If the United States, China, and other industrial countries cannot find a way to cut greenhouse gas emissions in the next decade, then humans may well be competing for a shrinking swath of good land as soon as the end of this century. And there is no way to make that contraction anything other than destructive and ruthlessly unfair within and across borders. Yes, we are done with our second chronicle of the collapse. So, uh, thank you, uh, Sharon Burke, for that mostly, for that mostly uh, honest uh, assessment of the climate migration wars heating up on the planet. But I've got to wrap this up because uh, I need to get back to my bog garden. I have been completely, uh, gotten completely obsessed with my bog garden, which is starting to look like Stonehenge out there. So if you enjoyed what Sharon had to share with you, uh, give Sharon some love and give her a thumbs up. And if you want to subscribe to Collapse Chronicles, that would be great. And I would absolutely love it if anybody wants ever to contribute to this channel for whatever it is I do with my life over here. I would appreciate, Sancho would appreciate the bone. And uh, I tell you how you can do that in the description to this video. And I really do appreciate anyone who has ever found it in their hearts, in their hearts and wallets to contribute to this craziness. Bye guys.
Yes, we are done. I promise. No more rants.